Welcome back. Big Tobacco is working out a settlement with Canadian provinces over the cost of tobacco use. But how big is smoking these days? Here's a look by the numbers. 14.5% of Canadians smoked in 2021, according to government data. 11% of people aged 25 and older, and 3.5% of 15 to 19-year-olds. That compares with 50% of Canadians who smoked back in 1965. As has always been true, more men than women are smokers as of 2021. The economic cost of smoking is high, estimated at $16.2 billion a year in direct and indirect costs, including health care or things like fires. Vaping, which is marketed as a way to help smokers quit, is definitely on the rise and skews younger. 30% of those under the age of 25 have vaped in the past 30 days, compared with 4% of those 25 and older. And while 58% of those older folk do say quitting tobacco is their primary motive to vape, A big majority of younger vapers, or 88%, have never tried tobacco in the first place. Their reason for vaping? 33% of young vapers say stress reduction. A court-mediated settlement could bring up to $500 billion in payments by big tobacco firms to Canadian provinces. In an open letter this week, three health organizations asked the provinces to earmark 10% of any settlement for use to stop tobacco use altogether. Rob Cunningham is Senior Policy Analyst at the Canadian Cancer Society, one of the signatories on that open letter. Rob, thanks for being with us. Thanks, Amanda. Good to be with you. And we can see in the data that there has been success in in stop smoking efforts. Uh, Today, or this week, I should say, another step in that direction, which is labeling on individual cigarettes of the harm they do. What are you hoping to see in a settlement? What do you want big tobacco to help pay for? Well, uh, we want there to be significant measures in a settlement to reduce tobacco use and to control the industry. Uh, So you mentioned that there should be substantial long-term funding for tobacco control through a fund separate from government, independent of government, with at least 10% of the proceeds of the settlement. But there should also be a ban on all remaining tobacco promotion. Promotion does continue. There should be targets set for tobacco reduction. And if those targets are not met, Tobacco companies should make significant extra payments. And also, tobacco companies in these cases have provided more than 6 million pages of secret internal tobacco company documents. Um, And all of those documents should be disclosed to the public Mm -hmm. so that we know what did the tobacco companies uh, do, what did they know, when was that, what were their marketing strategies. They have the best research in the country. That all should be publicly available. Rob, is there a realistic scenario where we get smoking down to zero? Uh, Nobody wants to make it illegal, but can we actually persuade enough people to put tobacco companies out of business? Uh, We have right now a federal government objective of under 5% tobacco use by the year 2035. We can achieve that. We can go much lower than that. Um, How quickly uh, smoking goes down depends on how fast federal and provincial governments can adopt new measures to reduce smoking, taxation, regulation, programs. But that's also one reason why we want as a result of this settlement that there be significant initiatives to reduce smoking. It's a historic once-in-a-lifetime initiative, opportunity mm-hmm. uh, to control the industry. They, cannot, they should not be able to have business as usual when the settlement is done. They should not be able in the future to do what they used to do. And that's why uh, this opportunity is so huge to reduce smoking. And, and we should note, I mean, the, the negotiations are ongoing. Uh, we, we assume it'll be, could be hundreds of billions in settlement. Uh, we don't really know till the deal is done. But is now the maximum leverage time for provinces to demand things from big tobacco? It is. Provinces uh, have tremendous leverage. There cannot be a settlement. The tobacco companies cannot get out of these negotiations unless provinces agree. Provinces have the power to insist on certain measures uh, to be in a settlement, and that's why we wrote that open letter two premiers, uh, two provincial governments, yep. so that they use that leverage and that opportunity. Not a ton of time here, but you know, we just heard in the stats that vaping is picking up. Young people are vaping, uh, and they're not using it to quit smoking, Rob. Uh, do you, does the Cancer Society worry about vaping replacing cigarettes? We're extremely concerned by the very high rates of youth vaping. And one report indicated that Canada had among the highest rates of youth vaping in the world. We've had such progress to reduce smoking among youth that we do not need a new generation of kids becoming addicted to nicotine through e-cigarettes. That's exactly what's happening. There's an opportunity for far more 
in terms of federal and provincial measures. The federal government can adopt a regulation to ban flavors in e-cigarettes other than tobacco flavor. Uh, there can be uh, e-cigarette taxes implemented. Provinces have an opportunity to do that. We need to do a lot more to prevent youth vaping. Rob, it's so good to have you for this. We appreciate your time. Thanks, Amanda. Rob Cunningham is Senior Policy Analyst with the Canadian Cancer Society. Time for the takeaway and being exposed to the elements. This week, one of the largest insurance firms in America said it will stop offering homeowners insurance in California. Existing policies will still be covered, but new ones will no longer be accepted. State Farm said a combination of higher claims from fires and floods in the state, plus inflation making rebuilds pricier, have made insuring homes there unprofitable. But this story isn't about one company deciding where and how it wants to do business. Insurance companies, or more specifically, the risk they're willing to underwrite, are the canaries in our collective coal mine. Their willingness to create a financial safety net allows our economies to hum, and individuals to shoulder risk they would otherwise find crippling. But climate change has altered the equation. State Farm isn't the first big insurance player to opt out of a market. AIG is out of California to new customers already, and many have stopped renewing in Florida. It's happened in Canada, too. Those kinds of decisions will only get worse as the global reinsurance market demands higher and higher amounts to back up the insurance companies themselves. Now, in places like Florida, insurers of last resort, backed by the state and tax dollars, are becoming the only choice for millions. That was never the intention, and it can't last. At the heart of the problem is extreme weather that will make fires, floods, and other devastating events more common. In an ideal world, there would be some trade-off a homeowner could make with the insurance company. Fireproof building materials help lower fire insurance, and then the risk of house fires. It would be great if the insurance industry could point the way on climate change and ask individuals to take action. But this is one case where the action has to be collective and taken not by individuals, but by governments. My takeaway? Living without insurance plunges people back into a financial dark age. That should be a wake-up call for governments to take whatever action is required before the canary is out cold. That's Taking Stock for this week. I'm Amanda Lang. Thanks for being with us.